and welcome to the Dowie Expert Series podcast. I'm Robert Coons. With me today is the indomitable and wonderful and glorious David Meikle. Uh, David is a, he is the senior disciple of Yang Guotai, a famous Bagua master uh, who lived in Vancouver, Canada. Welcome to the show, David. Uh, thanks, Robert. It's good to be here. Thank you very much for, for joining me. I really appreciate it. No, my pleasure. Excellent. And so, as I mentioned uh, in the introduction, you are an, an illustrious uh, member of our community who has been around for a long time. Uh, we know each other a little bit because of uh, hanging out on some of the darker parts of the internet, like the rum-soaked fist, um, which for all the youngins out there was a bad place that you shouldn't go to. Um, and uh, I, I, I'm so happy to have you here. Um, I want to ask you lots of questions because... Um, Master Yang Guotai was one of the, the great uh, representative Bagua masters of Canada. Uh, in fact, uh, at, at the beginning of my internal martial arts uh, journey, I strongly uh, considered coming out to Vancouver. And I always remember that um, I think on his website or his students or something said, when you come to Master Yang's house, he'll keep you for two hours to train and then he'll make you eat a big meal with him. And I remember that mm -hmm. always stuck in my mind. And until it took me a long time until I learned more about Chinese culture to see how, um, you know, welcoming that is and, and how nice it is. So so there's my Yang Guotai connection. But can can you tell us a little bit about your background uh, and how you got into Bagua and a little bit about, about your story with that? Yeah, sure. <clears throat> it's funny. Uh, I was teaching at... Uh... Uh, what used to be called Kwantlen College, it's now a university, but I was, I was teaching uh, some Shaolin and Taiji, you know, after work there and learning Bagua from another old uh, guy from mainland China uh, back in the early 90s. And I got introduced to, to Yang Guotai. I was doing some security work in the evenings at uh, the, the Playland, which is the local fair. And I, I spoke Chinese, just, I just had a couple of phrases. I spoke, said hello to some old Chinese woman that was just sitting there, uh, like working there. And she's like, oh, you know, you, you know, Chinese, uh, why? And like, well, I, you know, I do Kung Fu and mostly Bagua. And, and uh, she's like, well, let me introduce you to this old, old master at the park where I, where I do Qigong every morning. And I was, you know, like, huh, every guy that comes from China, they get a Yellow Pages ad and they, they're a master, you know? And then she's like, uh, yeah, he's, he's he's 73 now he's been doing it since he was eight i was like oh oh he's one of those yeah okay uh you know because there's the, the sort of the 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 split with what happened after the chinese cultural revolution where a lot of martial arts got banned and modified to be acceptable and he was predating that so that really had my interest and um it was funny because I, I went down to the park she told him i was going to come and so a week later or so i show up and and there he is, this guy, he's got like, he's missing a thumb and he's got scars all over his shins and stuff. And he's got a rubber mallet tucked into his belt. And he's talked to a couple of guys and uh, he's like, uh, he doesn't speak much English. He's like, ah, you, uh, Dayway? Like, are you David? I'm like, yeah. He goes, ah, uh, you before learn blah, blah, blah. He's like, yeah. He's like, oh, me look. So I start doing my Bagua that I learned, you know, really dry form that I learned from this old guy. And he kind of watched the first palm change. He's like, mm. he's kind of turns and starts talking to the other guys again. So I, you know, feeling like a fool, finished my form, standing there politely. And then he finally turns around. And he's like, that one, uh, Bagua Zhang. I'm like, yeah. He's like, no. So, you know, so like, this is a very active, you know, no one, no Bagua. This, this Bagua. And it just, suddenly you know he just like the whole body just and down and up and just like watching a gorilla transform into a lion transform into a bear i'm like ah and uh you, you know like 30 seconds of just quick movements he's like uh you want to learn i was like yeah he's like, okay and he just said walk and i you know at, at the time i was uh an electrician and in the early mid 90s there was not really much work construction wise so you, you'd get a couple of couple of months of work and then you'd be off for more months and then go on you know in, insurance or looking for part-time work so i ended up spending you know in between jobs like we'd be there at 4 30 in the morning uh just like a block down the street at the elementary school we'd train till lunch 
we'd eat, we'd train till dinner, we'd eat, and then go home at about 10, see you tomorrow. And, uh, you know, like the first three weeks, it was just hours upon hours of, let me show you how to walk a circle. And, you know, because he didn't speak English, and I didn't speak a lot of Chinese, um, a lot of it was putting his hand, like putting my hands on him to see like, where am my torso am I moving from to get my hand to do something? And, and then putting his hands on my torso, to, no, no, yeah, like that, good. And that was fantastic because, you know, for, for like the 15 years before I met him, it was always, it was always, okay, watch me do this. And you're, you know, so you're, you're, you're watching what the person's hands are doing versus, you know, what's happening in the torso. And, but to have someone like, let feel where I'm moving from, just totally brought it to another level of understanding. And then to have him even the first few weeks, I'm walking a circle and just holding a static posture, no palm changes, nothing. And he's walking beside you or behind you and he's putting resistance like to make sure that you don't break that connection that I'm gonna pull where I want you to twist. And I'm even here, even here, like everywhere that he was touching had something going on that I'd never knew because it was just always just watch, watch what I do and that was it, so. Uh, yeah, the introduction with him was rather, uh, rather interesting. In fact, I should have, it actually caused me to stop teaching. I went back to the, the college and went, guys, after two weeks, I just met a guy that made me realize, I don't know squat. Here's his phone number, you know? And I just, I stopped and just, I stopped training anything I'd ever learned before because I wanted to have what that guy's got. So that yeah, was my introduction to him. I love it. And may I ask you, he he was from uh, Beijing originally, right? That's right. Because you really nailed the Beijing accent. Oh, when you, I, when you did your imitation of, of him, and oh, it, yeah. the the R the Arhua came right out. Um, <laughs> <laughs> anyway, uh, that's really really cool. That's one of the funnest martial arts introduction stories that that I've ever heard. So now you you trained with him for a very long time, and. Uh, but during that time, you also, I believe, did spend uh, time in, in Asia, am I right? Yeah, that's right. I uh, ended up going to China with my work in the software industry. Um, and, you know, it, it's funny because everywhere I went, there was Taekwondo schools everywhere. <laughs> um, and then I, I'd ask my coworkers, like, hey, there's not much in the way of Kung Fu out here. And they're like, oh, yeah, Kung Fu. Like, everyone knows that it's not very effective. So they all do Taekwondo. I was like. Okay, sure. So it was a different, uh, a different feel. You could go to a public park and see guys like all the modern stuff. And and as an aside, I actually did meet a Barwa guy, like like another like a junior young Guo Tai uh, in Wuhan where I was living, and that was uh, that was kind of cool. Just kind of walking through the park one day with a buddy of mine, and and everyone's doing like you know the, their forms. And, it, and I always say, there's nothing wrong with those. Like some people really love that. It's just not my thing to do like the modern stuff. But, you know, that's not a dig. That's just my own preference. I I wanted this, you know. And I'm walking by a, an old guy that's doing, uh, what's it called? Uh, like a uh, big wheel. Like it's, you know, uh, Taiji does it one way. Bagua does the whole this way. And there's this guy doing that. So we're standing about... 20 feet away, just kind of, and he, he sees us, he waves us over and he's like, do you know what I'm doing? I'm like, yeah, that's Bagua. And he's like, oh, how do you know this? And we started talking and then it, it started practicing with him every now and then. And every time I went back to China to visit, I got to go to the park and find this guy because he'd give me an exercise. When you go home, practice this, I'll see you next year kind of thing. And just like some crazy, like Fuju Gongfa exercise that had nothing to do with this. You know, it was all about connection, connecting through the your torso. It's really cool. But he was like, don't circle walk here in the park. That was another thing. Don't like, it's it's too obvious. He was still that kind of guarded. Yeah. Like, push hands, a couple exercises, but don't do your bagua in the park. That was what he was about. Yeah, well, you know, if you do it in the park, it also invites a lot of interested people coming in and being like, hey, the foreigners doing Chinese Kung Fu. Let's, uh, let's exactly, model. Not that that's, that's exactly what happened. happened. Yeah. Same. Yeah. Like there'd be like, you, you'd look around after 20 minutes, there's like a hundred people 
three, three, you know, like two, three rows deep surrounding you. And they're starting to yell like <laughs> things at the, the, the old guy, like, you know, these secrets should be kept in China kind of thing. Um, <laughs> so, but uh, no, he, he was, a, he was fantastic. I really liked him. Nice. There's a wasp here. Uh, Anyways, you got a wasp? Yeah, it's over there now. Uh, Be gone. So, oh, that worked. <laughs> send him away with your cheat. That's right. Um, so now, uh, Master Yang was was teaching Chang style, right? Yep. And so, which um, do you know which variation of Chang style it was? What like what's the what's the lineage uh, pathway? Yeah, it was like from Chang Tinghua, then it went through. Uh, uh, Gosh, I, I had that up on the website. I haven't had to think about this in like 15 years. Um, uh, at some point, like through uh, his, so his teacher was Xu Jin Biao. And then uh, Wang Wang Kui was one of his Kung Fu uncles that he learned under. Uh, honestly, honestly, it's, it, I haven't had to think about that in so many years. I'd have to look it up to see what the exact names were. Uh, yeah, fair enough. Did. It wasn't coming through one of the Chung sons, so Yo Long or Yo Xin. It was from one of Chung's other disciples. Uh, I'd have again. I, I I can guarantee any other student of Yang's could answer that. <laughs> but, but I'm I'm having a momentary brain brain barf right now. So uh, yeah, I know so it, it came through Liu Bin and then um, Xu Jin Biao. He his, his it was always Xu Jin Biao his his accent, but um, yeah, nice. Excellent. So now Chung style for, for people who, you know, don't have background in Bagua, basically there's more than two styles of Bagua in the um, Dong Hai Chuan school of Bagua, but the two representative styles are Chung style and Yin style. And right. so um, it's not fair for me to ask you to compare them, but can you tell me about the special sort of qualities of Chung style that make it a unique martial art? Uh, from Yeah, from absolutely. So, you know, and I'm just regurgitating what Yang Shifu had often explained to us. And, you know, he says like, you know, and, and some of the stuff you get in the books and hopefully the questioning will lead me into other areas that you're not going to get in a book. But, um, you know, like Yin Fu came from like, like a Shaolin background. So he had like compared to what we do, a little more strikes, kicks, uh, kind of a an approach. But Chung... Chung style comes from Chung Tinghua, who was a Chinese wrestler. So a lot more throws, takedowns, joint locks. Uh, so and the even the the walking is quite different uh and how it's done. And it's like if you look at it, so Dong Hai Chuan. Here, I'm gonna here here's what here's how Yang Yang told us at lunch one day. He's like Dong Hai Chuan's walking through the woods. And he's a martial arts guy, and he sees these Taoist hermits shucking rice with their bare hands. And if you've ever seen how they how they shuck rice, when I lived in China, we went out of the city one time into a very rural area where they grew their own rice. And what they would do is they would lay it across the road, put uh, two by tens across the road, so the cars drove over that. It would uh, thresh the rice for them because uh, it's a very sturdy uh, stalk. But he watched these guys just going shoom, and using their palms to do it. And he's kind of, you know, like watching. And he also, he also, during that story, he talked about how they would, they basically with Qinggong ran across the water to sort of you know, disappear. Anyways, so, you know, at some point he, he finds these guys, starts training with them and they teach him all these exercises. So the way I like to talk about it uh, is he's got, these principles that he's learned from these uh, Taoist hermits and rather than a martial art, but principles of, 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 of so many things. And then he, he, you know, so let's say Chung Ting Hua comes and uh, Yin Fu comes and he's teaching them principles. So they're basically absorbing that into what they already have. And I, so that's my personal take on why they're so different. It's like their own style with Bog sort of um, permeating and wrapping through it all. So uh, then when you start looking at like Bagua, like the Chung style that we do based on Chinese wrestling. So um, yeah, so a lot of the exercises, like we'll, when I'm teaching a class, it's going to be like, 
here are some conditioning exercises and this will, you know, it's more about, you know, connection and, and, um, uh, you know, moving the body and then, at, you know, then partway through the class, okay, let's do some techniques. These techniques are in every, every style, but the principles are different on how we do it. But the, but, and I'll say to guys openly, but the real part about learning Bagua is the warm up part of the class where you're doing these particular exercises for learning how to move your body because techniques you can get anywhere. So that's what my teacher always said too was the single movement stuff and the basic stuff at the start is where the real skill comes from. Yep. He, he said to me, Master, the masters in private, they practice single movements. So hear that, kids? That's that's one of the messages from today. <laughs> um, I, anyway, so now we got uh, Chung style and the idea that it's based on special principles. But when I think about Chung style, right, the thing that sticks out to me is, is Tang Nibu. It's the mud waiting mm -hmm. step, right? And so I remember uh, back in the day on online forum discussions, you were uh, very, very vocal about how Tang Nibu had to follow a particular set of principles. And that, if I remember correctly, that um, a lot of it was about the relationship of the of the abdominal floor to, to the feet to the ground. Am I getting that kind of right? How does Tang Nibu work in, in Chung Uh Okay. Yeah, it's... So... With the with the way it came through our Chung style, it was, you know, it translates as mud waiting step. And a lot of people, and I think more maybe perhaps more yin fu influence, it's like that, you know, we use we use term rolling the pencil so the feet stay flat and you're you're rolling a pencil. So when I the the original Bagua that I'd learned before meeting Yang Shifu was that style. And he had to break me of that because that it's like that's great, but that's not what we're doing here. And so what he ended up doing is just like getting down on his knees and grabbing each of my ankles. And he's like, you're walking in mud. And then, you know, you go to move your foot and you fall backwards until you learn how to engage the core. So I wouldn't necessarily say it's like, yes, it's about the pelvic floor, but it's also like that whole core engagement of uh, like, we would say your kidney lifts your bone marrow and your stomach lifts your, uh, the muscle tissue. And if you can uh, understand that with each step, it's like you're drawing, you know, you're, you're using your hip to draw the whole leg up and out of the mud and then pushing the hip back down to, to find the floor beneath that deep mud. And then sort of under, and then you don't need to lift your foot high to express it visually. You want to experience that on the inside with how you're, you're engaging yourself. So, um, so then it does, it gets away from that. I'm just sliding to, it's almost like a, I like to use, you know, the slinky, the, the, the coil is like, think of the slinky going down the stairs, kind of thing that kind of whoop, whoop. So contracting and then expanding to, to lift your leg. There's, then you start looking at even like the mind process as you're, as you're stepping, that if you can envision as you're moving that each of your, the cells of your tissue of your body, as you're lifting your heel, that they're, they're going from like this and they're contracting and, and as they all contract together it helps even like draw that the tissue up so you're not just mechanically moving something and then when you're putting your foot back down that you're actually uh expanding that like the, the tissue or the cells are expanding to to reach through what you're doing so there's so much more involved in just like and we walk a circle there's just so much happening you know at, a, at the intellectual level of of what you're like that and that's just one of the little windows of what's happening in and do this and do this and do this kind of thing so yeah that's that's an awesome description um now another question that i have then because i get to i get to nerd out so i'm gonna ask the nerdy questions <laughs> um so the, another question that i have then is a lot of people who do um who do bagua uh they're very light on their feet but um, I want to ask you, do you, what's your impression of coming into practice uh, using, let's say, a heavier kind of body method that's based around principles of sinking really deeply and then getting light as a result of that after years of practice? Do you have any kind of that thing on your radar? Oh, exactly. Um, we used to put, uh, like, you know, get the heaviest ankle weights we could get our hands on and just put them on our ankles 
and and then spend the whole day even just like when well, you're walking back to lunch you're walking back to the, the the field to train you got your ankle weights on and the it was always fun because when, once you took your ankle weights off you you go to step and your feet are like you know you're you're walking like a chicken like this is weird but you know, he, he was the kind of guy like he's he'd like, you know, you really want to get this, get a couple of like small, like, like, like uh, some heavy logs and tie a rope to the logs and then tie that to each ankle and then walk back and forth across the soccer field, like doing long, low uh, stepping exercises so that you really understand, like, like uh, there's one of the, the gym and, you know, and, and, you know, with the Beijing axis here. Right. But one of the jin is ba jin, so that it means to uproot. So it'd be like, imagine there's this oak tree with the here's the tree and there's a root that comes down and your, your foot got hooked in that root. And so you're going to uproot that whole tree. And it's, so then with that idea and that's why he would, you know, he'd get down there and, and hold your ankle and give you that weight. So you had to learn how to use your front leg even to help draw the back leg. And I think that's even one of the things that a lot of people miss in if they're doing chunk style and they're rolling pencil, which has different principles, then if you're not using your front leg for your stepping, then you're missing half of your step. Uh, and that's where the, like you have, what is it? Um, uh, chen tui la ho tui, front leg pulls back to back leg. And then uh, ho tui chen, uh, chen tui, where once that back leg gets in front and you're still on that one leg, it's now your back leg. And then it pushes. And that's where that, that whole reaching and expansion of the cells come through. But, you know, uh, understanding to under, to be able to understand that you could, the easiest way to understand that is to have that actual resistance. And for me, it was my teacher going arf, arf, like hands here, hands here. And you're you just like, Wah. but, you know, like, yeah, put the put the weights on because you're not going to it's like, how can I learn to throw you if I've never thrown you? So you want to learn to throw somebody practice throwing them, get that weight. And I would say, be the gorilla. It's natural to like, uh, be the gorilla in the beginning. Your body will naturally figure it out and become more, more proficient at that so that it starts to let go of the, the you know, muscles and, and tissues that it doesn't need for that movement. And hopefully you'll start correcting your alignment of everything till it, it becomes effortless. But you need to have that, in my opinion, you need to have that weight on there to understand. To, to you'll never find those muscles without that actual resistance on there. And then once you have that, Sure, you can, you know, ditch the weights, but, you know, it, it, in my opinion, it, just from personal experience, what worked for me was having that actual live resistance of either a person or the ankle weights or just the understanding of, um, you know, what's it like to tie a log to my legs and drag that across. So. So I've been keeping score since we started here. And so far, I think we've been going for probably 15 minutes and we've talked about the core of the body and we've talked about the legs so far so i just want to point out again to everybody who's watching right this is what the real internal martial arts practice starts with if, if you don't get that stuff you don't get it so having said that though we got to bring the whole body into the focus while we while, while we're still talking about bagua so in terms of training routines um beyond you know the basic stuff um that's the most important stuff um what do you guys do do you do do you do palm changes do you do like mother palms and and old eight palms and stuff like that or how's that work a lot of what we did when i first met yang shifu you know because he was such a just so much about fighting back then and uh and i say that in a, in a very grateful way because that's what i was looking for and uh, we didn't do, we had a couple of forms. We did the, you know, twin palm change, single palm change. Everything else was just uh, exercises. And imagine, like, if I put this in a Taiji context, imagine I'm doing brush knee push back and forth across the soccer field for three hours. We would do exercises. They wouldn't be Taiji brush knee push, but we would do Bagua specific exercises back and forth, either, either a straight line across the field or because we work on a circle. You do that for an hour and it wasn't much in the way of forms. It was just conditioning. And he's like, this is the cotter pin of Bagua is Fuju Gongfa. And he's like forms without Fuju Gongfa, you'll never understand a form because you're not, you know, a lot of these exercises, like as an example, lying on your back with your arms over your head, 
And then you have to use your shoulder blades like this. And, you know, in the beginning, everyone kind of, they, they move in this way, but learning how to articulate. So you're using your shoulder blades to, and your, your heels are off the floor to pull yourself across the, the floor and then, and then, and then go back. So you're learning, you're not only learning how to move, but you're giving that resistance like of, of your body weight uh, as you're dragging your body back and forth that you have the conditioning as well. These aren't forms, but they're gonna totally uh, reformat how you move your body and how you connect with yourself. Nice, that's wicked. That's so fun. Nobody else, you know, like imagine. Very, very few people get to train like that. It was that that's why after two weeks with him, I was like, I don't know squat. <laughs> <laughs> that's excellent. Wow. So now um you do you teach too, right? And uh you're now you're in the greater Vancouver area. Where's your where's your school or you where are your students located? Um I had a school in, until uh, just before COVID. And it's like, you know, when, when COVID hit, it was like, all right. Let's not do this for a while. So, you know, these days I do what Yamshpo used to do. Like we're just out in a park, co co coordinate with the guys on, on based on the weather. Like, do we go to that park or that park for the covered area? And uh, just do it that way. So I'm in New West, which is like, you're in Vancouver, you go east, you cross the road, you hit Burnaby, further east, you cross the road, you're in New Westminster. So, um, Okay. I know, I know New Westminster. I don't, I've never been there personally, but okay. um, I've, I've heard of it because um, I had a, gosh, I think there was somebody who was uh, like the daughter of my Taiji teacher or something at one point was, uh, was out there anyway. So this is another question that I have. This one, this one is also fun because um, I've talked to one other person from Vancouver uh, and we, we did talk a little bit about Vancouver, but you know, Vancouver was or is, a hotbed of Chinese martial arts. Like yep. it's so I'm, I'm from outside of Toronto, but close enough to Toronto that I trained a lot there and, and I trained in Montreal, but I never trained in Vancouver, but it was like, it was the bee's knees. If you wanted to do Chinese martial arts in Canada and dare I say, it was pretty much on par with any major American city during the nineties and early two thousands. So I want to know when you were like, I know that, you know, Yang Guotai, in your estimation, was the person who changed the game for you. But I want to know when you were growing up in the Chinese martial arts in Vancouver, what was it? What was it like? Uh, it's interesting. You know, if if I were to go to like some of the smaller towns where there was only a couple of old Chinese guys, it would would have been very different than being here, where it's like you you used to be able to go to a place called uh, Queen. Was it Queen's Park? No, that's in the West. What was that one called? Stanley Park. Ah, early nineties. We used to go up to this one park at about four o'clock in the morning and train before we went to work every day. And there'd be all these guys up there, you know, like that group. There'd be like fifteen different groups, and they're some. They're all friends, but they're all secretly in competition with each other. And some of those guys, there was a couple of guys. Like there was a guy Chung Ta Chen. I remember who who passed away quite a few years ago. But, uh, you know, he he really marshaled a lot of those guys together. And I remember in like 93 or 94, he had a, a Tai Chi Lifestyles convention at the Cultural Center where I met some I made some really dear friends like uh, Kevin Walbridge. Um, Mike Smith was already a friend of mine by then. Um, and that's why I, I met like Dave Harris down in Seattle. He came up and kicked everyone's butt. And uh, it, there was a lot, like, like I said earlier, you know, like... You're going to get guys that come from another country that because there's no one to challenge their claim uh, that there was a lot of guys. Yeah, you know, sure, you train with that guy, but you might have been at the very back of the park, you know, 20 rows back versus the guy at the front because he's like one of the, you know, the front running disciples or something like that. And in fact, there was a guy uh, here now in Richmond. I'm not going to make no names, but his his claim to fame was that he taught at this location in Guangzhou. And I ended up living in Guangzhou for just under a year back at, uh, 20 years ago when I was living in China. And I went to that location and it's the same as saying like, I teach at BC Place Stadium. It, like, like there's, there, first of all, there's no martial arts there. It was just, it, it, it's an event stadium. And you're saying that's where your school is because no one's gonna know any, any different, you know? So yeah, there, there are some decent guys out here 
but there's a lot of noise. And then, you know, it's probably the wrong, the wrong word to use, because I'm not saying that as, as an insult, but just it, it, to get to what you're looking for. You know, there, it's like 57 channels and nothing's on. So um, if it was only one or two, then it'd be easier to go that guy or that guy, you know? So um, yeah, there, there's, there are a lot, you know, some good talent out here, but then it's, you know, uh, there's still the yellow page ad guys too. So, and, and they do well for themselves and people are happy and healthy. So I can't knock that, you know, like, it's, so I could turn around then as I do this verbal diarrhea and go, shut up, Michael. <laughs> and go, yeah, man, there's some good stuff out here. <laughs> it's just not all for me. That's all. Yeah. Yeah. I hear you. Well, Toronto is starting to catch up with you guys because now we're the, we're the premium, uh, you know, immigration site, right? So we're starting to get, um, it's freaky. You know, you can go into uh, into Markham, um, where many of the older Chinese immigrants are. Yep. And you can meet people who are like, you know, um, inheritors of, I met a guy who was an inheritor of uh, the, the Chen Small Circle style, who like legit took me to his basement where, where he had all the pads on the ground and everything. And Wrote yeah. out all his lineage charts. He was he wasn't a nice man, so I didn't hang out with him very much. But but you know, so 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 I I'm really happy to be uh, in this area right now. But Vancouver, like you know, I remember it was the it was the dream. We all wanted to go out and study with like but I'm not going to say who. But anyway, you you know how it be. Um. So now, having having said that, um. There you're there you're 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 about more than just martial arts though. And you're doing something else which is very fascinating, um, which is very different from martial arts, I think, or maybe it's maybe it's similar to you, I don't know. But um you've been spending time uh in, in Peru uh learning plant medicine. Can can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, sure. Um you know, it's oh man, where do I begin? Uh yeah, so I I I've been learning uh the my path of of training just sort of led me down suddenly found myself uh you know going to peru and sitting in plant medicine circles and having such a life changing experience that it's actually given me an even better understanding of bagua and the things that yang shifu was trying to teach me and how you know like with, earlier i mentioned um that it, it comes from the Taoist internal arts, which, you know, in some circles, if you get into certain discussions with people, they're going to be like, yeah, that's Taoist witchcraft that it comes from. And that's why, you know, these guys can do these astounding feats, you know, and uh, I'm trying to say, when I look at what Yang Shifu was trying to teach me, and I was going to digress back to Bagua for a sec, what he was trying to show me about Bagua, like it's giving me the understanding that a lot of what Yang Shifu showed us was, and I use this term extremely loosely, was the shaman, like the shamanistic side of Bagua that, but it was just, this is Bagua. We didn't, we didn't separate that and use like this uh, sort of modern generic term that comes from Nepal or Tibet or something that it's just the energy aspect of Bagua but then shifting into the plant medicine work where, you know, it brings you into a different realm and very mind opening medicines that it has redefined my understanding of what Yang Shifu was trying to uh, relay to us that you can get through circle walking or seated meditation or doing this couple of different exercises, do this a thousand times, you know? And, and so um, like if I jump forward, I'm, I'm nine years into uh, working with plant medicines, eight and a half years on an apprenticeship where I'm uh, one of the senior apprentices with a, a plant medicine maestro. And he's what we call a curandero, like think of the Spanish word uh, cure, cura. And uh, so he's a, a plant medicine healer that I've been training with because I had such a serious uh, set of concussions a number of years ago that uh, I found myself in Peru to receive healing because they're like, you'll never work again kind of thing. And uh, it turned my life around. And not only did it help with the concussion, which 
unless I tell you, you'd have no idea that four years ago I was learning how to sweep a floor. And um, it, it has just been so life altering to do that plant medicine work that I'm now like one of his senior apprentices and just learning how to carry that medicine so that eventually I'll be able to, um, you know, do that for other people, do what, what he's done for me. That's wonderful. I, I, I appreciate your opening up around about that. Um, it's a very, very, very interesting field. I don't know how much we can get away with talking about because of the YouTube algorithm, but I do oh. appreciate that. And it's something that, uh, that the, the adults in the audience who, uh, I think as, uh, as Leary and old Ram Das said, uh, you got to be at least 24. Uh, so for the younger folks, just wait a couple of years. Um, <laughs> YouTube requires me to say that. Okay. Anyway, so, <laughs> um, anyway, this is this has been really cool. I don't want to take your whole day, but I do have a couple more small Absolutely. questions. One question is relative to Bagua, Changstel Bagua, the Changstel Bagua that you and your uh Kung Fu brothers and sisters, possibly, um, that you guys learned. Where do you see this going uh, over the next decade? Man. Um, well, I mean, you've got this split between the pre-revolutionary and post-revolutionary. And, you know, in that old adage, like, whichever wolf you feed, right? So, uh, you know, the, the more guys that that are interested in investing in like the old style versus I'm, I'm, I want to, you know, get an award, get a trophy or something like that, which, you know, that's great. You know, like at least there's something, at least they're, like I said, as long as people are happy, then you can't negate that. But, you know, the, the, the old stuff that, that a bunch of us are, are, are carrying, not just me, but other people that are, we're carrying, it's hard to find people that, that want to knock on your door and say, Hey man, I'm, I'm ready to like uproot and, and learn from you the way you did from your teacher. And, um, just have someone that's going to carry it. Yeah, gee, I don't know. I'm choking up. <laughs> uh, yeah, no, it's like that though. Like I had a number of students that, you know, trained with me for a long time when I went through my injuries. Yeah. They all, they all disappeared. And it's like, man, like why not just continue like training what I, you had enough like some of these guys had enough to to carry you know and but it's like you know as as my my own teenage daughter says it's too hard your kung fu's too difficult well it, yeah because I'm, I'm not i'm not here to make you jump high and do a fancy kick i want you to just go boom and understand you know like bagua is really about self-mastery and self-discovery and everyone gets so hot, caught up in in like the fighting aspect and I was too, you know, and, and that's, that's great. And that's, if that's what draws people in great, hopefully at some point they'll have that transformation of self where they go, Ooh, there's something more beneath the surface of this. And it's about going inwards rather than worrying about somebody in front of me. And, uh, you know, that part, I, I think that, you know, if I really had to say it with, with the, with the, with the internet and more people being, you know, able to communicate this stuff that, it's going to hit the right ears and hopefully those guys will, you know, uh, invest in that rather than, you know, um, I want to go to the park and show, show off all these forms. And, uh, and that's not a shot at anybody because, you know, we've, we've all been there. So, um, yeah, just finding the, like, you know, as Yang used to say, the wave washes up on the, on the, on the beach and washes away the sand and the gold remains. So it's like finding the gold out there. They're out there. It's just a matter of, of finding, you know, guy getting that message out to people, and then that something motivates them. And if I have to motivate, this is my thing. If I have to motivate you, I don't want you. You know, like like what are you doing to motivate your students? Nothing, because if I have to, then what am I? What am I investing my time into you for? So they're out there. If I'm out there, they're out there. It's just a matter of you know making sure it'll it'll happen. So you know, it's just. You know, who who wants to invest the time, you know, uh, in the years that it takes to, to develop that skill? It's just, you know, who wants to feed those wolves? So, you know. Well, no assuming that we have uh, at, at least one uh, 
at least one Ramus or Romulus in the audience, uh, where do where do they find you? <laughs> so was that a question? You know yeah, it was a uh, question. Do you, where do where do they find you? Mm. If they want to study I'll, with you, I'll have to put my website back up. Um, I'll I guess I'll, I'll you know I, I I took the website down with COVID and stuff like that. So, but it you know I'll I'll have to put it back up. It is risingsunkungfu.com. But then I've got some really qualified kung fu brothers. Like there's Josh Crossley. He's in um, Victoria. Naman Sinha. He moved to uh, Australia, I think. Dennis Mace is in Seattle. He's fantastic. Will Winram. He learned a lot, but he went in a different direction. So he's not really doing that. Um, uh, that's the only names I can think of right now. But Dennis Mace, Mace Martial Arts in Seattle. He's got he's got a gift that guy. Awesome. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Can you please stay on the Zoom with me? Uh, I'm just going to wrap it up here, and then I'm going to turn off the recording. So sure. there you have it, everybody. Um, if you live in the Greater Vancouver area, you want to learn real Chung style Bagua, um, and you have you want to feed that wolf then um, you know that you can contact with uh, David Meikle. Um, I hope that you enjoyed the interview. I hope that you you learned more than one thing from it. Uh, certainly there's a lot of treasure in there. Um, and uh, I appreciate your having joined me, David. Uh, thanks everybody for watching and we'll see you in the next one. Mm -hmm.